point in size and in price, but it is something that is accurate and of educational value. So you see there you get an extreme from one thing to the other. The versatility of Mr. Spitz is through that one of the things that has amazed me. He's invented a great many devices which the armed forces use together with these planetaria which they use in training for celestial navigation. I could go on and a lot of things about him, but I think what you'd like to see is what the instrument will do. And so, without taking more time, I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Armand Spitz, and as he comes to take my place, I'm going over and close the door for you, Armand, and I do get the light out of the way. There are a few little devices. If you close the outer doors first, and then those uh, inner doors, I'd appreciate it. A few little things that we haven't quite expected in the room yet. Little finishing touches, which must still be done. And the outside door closers have not been installed, and so they're still manually controlled. I think we're just about ready, and how about things back there? Everything and can you people hold the fort if I sit out front, or would you like me to stay back and... I think we can do it. I'm going to try something now. Well, you're in for it. You've got to try something. Mr. <laughs> Fitz. Well, friends, I'm going to let the planetarium for a few minutes speak for itself. I think perhaps there's nothing that could be more effective than letting you see the planetarium under as nearly ideal conditions as possible. by one in the infinite meadows of heaven blossom the lovely stars the forget-me-nots of the angels whenever the stars come out it seems that these words of Longfellow demand attention to a greater extent perhaps not at any other time. You and I are privileged to live on earth. We are privileged to go out of doors on every clear night. To make friends with stars which will lift us outside ourselves. And yet how few of us have ever taken this to heart how few of us have ever really taken advantage of this privilege. Emerson once said, Oh, why didn't someone teach me the stars in my youth that I might have spent even more years contemplating the beauty of these celestial messengers. And someone else said, If the stars should appear one night in a thousand years, only one night in a thousand years. How would men believe and adore and cherish for many generations the remembrance of the city of 
God which had been shown. Ever since man has been man, he's been looking above him, looking at the stars, and his attitude toward the stars has been such that there's been a constant change in his thinking. I can assure you that the very first men on earth, the first that could be called men rather than anthropoid apes, didn't look at the stars. They didn't look at the stars for a very simple reason. They were cavemen. They were afraid to be out of doors at night. Night spelled danger. Night spelled the possible approach of ferocious animals. Therefore, when the night came, they went to their caves. <coughs> they hid until the next day dawned. And when the next day dawned, they went out of doors and found that they could hunt for food and in that way they kept alive. And I'm no anthropologist, but I have a very strong hunch that it was a very, very, very brave man who first went out of doors at night, out of this cave at night, and when he looked up and he saw some points of light in the sky, he didn't understand those points of light, of course. But there they were. And probably it took centuries for the, the very existence of these points of light to dawn upon his primitive consciousness. And then a few centuries later he thought to himself, heavens, this is nice. And then he went into his cave and he dragged out his wife by the hair of her head and he pointed up to the stars and ever since then people have been making love under the light of the stars. Actually, men look at the skies today with a tremendous amount of appreciation, an amount of awe. They see things that they didn't know before and as they reach out into space, looking at the stars is a challenge to men. And whether it be the mind of primitive man, trying to decide whether the day brings the sun or the sun brings the day, or whether it's the mind of an Einstein who tries to tie the entire universe together with a unified field theory, I can assure you that men have always met the challenge. Not only have they met the challenge, but they've invented equipment to do it. It was said of Einstein that all he needed was a piece of paper and a pencil. Men can do marvelous things with a piece of paper and a pencil. And then he has the ability to invent still other tools. Optic glasses called telescopes. And spectroscopes and cameras. And radio receivers. And other things which make it possible for him to <laughs> extend his reach beyond the space we know. And to learn more and more and more about the stars. And as man has done this, he's become a greater being. Today, man can look out at the sky, at all these hundreds and thousands of stars, and he can say very positively how hot the stars are and how far away they are and what they're made of. And he can tell how they're moving because he has met the challenge of the things that nature has placed before him. I've heard some people say they don't like to look at the stars because it makes them feel too small. And of all things that have irritated me time, time, and time again, 
that statement probably has irritated me more consistently than any other I know. Any fool knows that we're small. No one who has any brains at all will claim that we are big, physically. There is a great English astronomer who said, after all, man with all of his glory is simply a chunk of protoplasm which happens to be inhabiting a very small pebble. And that pebble has a wisp of atmosphere and a smear of ocean. And it's on a whirling dervish sort of dance as it spins and whirls around the sun. And the sun, itself a star, is only a mediocre star. It happens to be important because it happens to be ours. But that our, that's our sublime egotism that makes it important. It need not necessarily be important in the overall scheme of nature. It's neither the hottest, nor the coldest, nor the largest, nor the smallest, nor the brightest, nor the faintest star. It's just a fair, in-between, medium sort of star. And there's only one of two billion, three billion, four billion stars in our own galaxy, our own star city. And there are hundreds of millions of star cities, like our own Milky Way. So anyone who has any comprehension does not need any marked intelligence to say that man is a small thing from a physical point of view, in comparison with the tremendousness of the cosmos. But friends, you and I have the ability to go out of doors at night to see the beauty of the sky. We are representatives of a race that can plumb the depths of space. We have the divine audacity to reach out and challenge the secrets of nature and to find the answers. And no individual, no race, no species that can do things like that can be small. Therefore, a study of astronomy should be one of the greatest challenges that men can possibly be given. And so it has proved to be throughout time. And that's the reason that when we look above us and see the story book of the stars, we realize that we're looking at something which goes back beyond the dawn of our earliest history. When man first looked at the skies, he knew nothing about the stars. Our first records are only five or six thousand years old. And yet then they were already talking about the ancient stories of the stars. Because those stories had been passed down by word of mouth from generation to generation. So the skies that we have overhead on this night or any night, or from any part of the world, is simply a classical picture book. And as such, I think it deserves a little bit of attention. Now, I must confess that this approach to talking about the planetarium is a little bit different from any that I've taken. I'm simply thinking out loud as I talk. And I'm introducing the planetarium to you in a slightly different way. But I, I'd like you to think of it from that point of view. Here you are sharing the ability to be a part of an eternal, Universal history book, mythology book, story book. And the part that we play in the overall picture may become a part of the legends of the future. Now you notice that for a short time I had the sky rolling overhead and then I put the brakes on the earth. That was done quite deliberately. I didn't want to make you too old too fast. Already you're 24 hours older than you were when you came in. I don't believe it's been too painful, and I can warn you, I'm going to make you a good deal older than you are now before you leave. But uh, I didn't want to let time get out of hand. Very quickly I want to point out a few things, and then we'll let the time pass some more. In the first place, arching overhead from the north to the south, you'll see a band of hazy light. We call that the Milky Way. 
the Milky Way is made up of the combined light of countless millions of stars so far away that we can't see them as individual stars at all. That is our galaxy, our star city. And it used to be that people didn't know what caused the Milky Way. Today we do know. Just as you can look out toward the horizon of Fort Worth, and you can see the glow of city lights. And if you have strong binoculars, you can look out beyond the glow of the city lights of Fort Worth and see the glow of the lights of Dallas or some other city. So we can look out beyond our own star city, our own galaxy, and find the light of other galaxies, other star cities. So here we look up above us and we see our star city, our galaxy, our Milky Way system. And practically everything we see in the sky is a part of that galaxy. There are a few objects which are not. If you look over here in the northeastern sky, you'll see seven stars that are familiar. If you know any group at all, you know them. That, of course, is the Big Dipper. And the Big Dipper, as familiar a group of stars as there is in the entire heavens, is probably most famous because of the fact that these two stars on the upper side of the bowl of the Dipper, where pointing to the North Star, and the North Star indicates the North more accurately than you would be looking if you were to follow the needle of a mariner's compass. This is almost exactly North. This star is overhead at the North Pole. If we were at the North Pole, instead of Fort Worth right now, you'd see the star overhead. Incidentally, you'll be at the North Pole in just a little while. I'm going to take you there. I'm going to take you to the North Pole. I'm going to take you to the equator. And I'm going to take you somewhere else, but we'll hold that as a special surprise for later on. Go back to the Big Dipper again and follow not the two stars that are pointers to the North Star, but follow the handle of the Dipper down here in the curved line and see that over there in the eastern sky you'll see a bright star. And that star is Arcturus. And if you extend that same curved line down past Arcturus, you come to the bright star Spike. And still a little bit farther on, you come to a little group of stars called Corvus, the crow. All right, there is one region of the sky which many, many people know. Over here is a little group of stars called Cassiopeia. If we look up here, we see an object which is not a star. That's the planet Mars. Mars is shown there, looking like a star, slightly reddish as it looks in nature. It is a member of the Sun's family. Like the Earth, it has no light of its own. We can see it only because the Sun's light is shining on it. Here's a little group of stars that looks like fireflies in the sky. Those are the Pleiades, the so-called Seven Sisters. Here's another planet, the planet Jupiter, and here are the twin stars, Castor and Pollux. Here's Araga, the charioteer. And up here are three stars in a short straight line. These represent the belt of a great hero of ancient days. His name was Orion. These two stars are in his shoulders. These are in his head. Here's his belly and the sword dangling down below his belt. And these two stars are in his legs. If you follow the belt of Orion over to the left, you'll come to a very bright star. As a matter of fact, it's the brightest star in the entire sky. This is called Sirius, the dog star. And it's a part of the constellation of Canis Major, the big dog. Here's the head of the dog. This is the jeweled license tag he has in his dog collar. Here's his front leg, and here's his hind leg, and there's the tip of the tail. Up here is the puppy dog star, Procyon, in the constellation of Canis Minor. Over here, is a fuzzy little group of stars. This is called Coma Berenice. Tiny little group of stars about which there's a very fascinating legend of the queen of Egypt who promised her husband that if he came home safely from the war, she had sacrificed the beautiful hair that, of which she was been so proud. But somehow or other, her hair was cut off. And when her husband came home, 
after he had expected that he would find his wife with long hair. He couldn't understand why she had cut off her hair so soon. Until so the court astronomers, or astrologers as they were in those days, said, never mind, king, don't worry. Your queen was so happy that you were first from home, safely from the war, that she had her hair cut off and they placed it in the sky in a little constellation called Coma Berenice, the hair of Queen Berenice. So you find history and drama and comedy and romance and tragedy in the sky. And all of these things are challenges to the mind of man. We're going to watch for a short time, once more as the earth turns on its axis, and we'll notice that the Big Dipper climbs up moves around the sky. We'll notice that this star Arcturus doesn't move up straight, it moves up on a slant. So does Spike. Look over here at the Pleiades or at Mars or at Aldebaran or at Regal or Betelgeuse or Bellatrix or Sali for Alnitakal or Alnilam and Mintaka. They're all setting on a slant. Every star in the sky sets on a slant when you see it from Fort Worth. Because we happen to be in a part of the earth where the sky we must set that way. But now I'm going to take you away from here. I'm going to take you to the North Pole. And I can assure you that we can do that very rapidly. It's not nearly as long as you might expect. And as we go to the North Pole, you're going to see the surface of the earth. We're going to go down to the center of the earth. And we're going to see the earth as I hope that none of you will ever see it. But if you do go there, as I fully expect to, uh, let me assure you that what I'm going to show you now is what you will see from a scientific point of view at any rate. I won't attempt to give you any idea of the, st uh, the other spectacles that may be visible. However, if you do go to hell, or come with me there, you won't expect to see the stars. That is a privilege which is reserved for those, uh, those of us who are on the surface of the earth. Therefore, we'll erase the stars and the planets from the sky. But when you look above you from the center of the earth, you will see the shadows of the continents. So here you are in the center of the earth looking up and the sunlight is shining through the oceans and the continents themselves are causing a shadow. You see up here is Florida, Gulf of Mexico, Yucatan, here's Fort Worth right here. Here's Cuba, Dominican Republic and Haiti, Puerto Rico, here's the Panama Canal, here's South America, here's 
Mexico, California, Alaska, <coughs> Hudson's Bay, Labrador, Greenland. This is my home in Philadelphia. Here are the Great Lakes. I like to hear a sport word. Now, looking at the sky like this gives us a new picture of geography. And that's something that will be done with the aid of this instrument as it's used for school groups, for boy and girl scout groups, and for any others who come, grown-ups or children. Actually, if we were to look at the Earth like this, we'd learn a tremendous amount about it that we haven't known before. But now let's imagine that we're not looking at the shadow of the Earth, but let's look, imagine that we're looking out beyond the Earth and we can see the stars. And there is a spot on Earth underneath any, every single star at any given moment. You see where the Big Dipper is, over this part of North America. You see that wherever you look, you can get the geographical location or the substellar point of a star. And then, of course, we realize that the Earth is not standing still, it's turning underneath the sky. And therefore, the stars appear to move from east to west across the Earth. And as we watch this, we realize that we can get a completely new picture of this Earth on which we live. Actually, at this moment, we're looking at the Earth as though we are the, on the inside of the sphere. As a matter of fact, we're on the inside not only of the terrestrial sphere, the Earth, but of the celestial sphere, the sky. And these two things, of both of which we are the apparent center, have constant changes, one moving across the other and causing the passage of time. Now we can erase the Earth. And once more, look at the sky as we're accustomed to seeing it from the center from the surface of the Earth. <clears throat> we realize that there are certain concepts which are a part of our everyday life and we'd only stop to realize that they're astronomical would might be rather interesting. For example, you're here this evening, 8.30 p.m., 9 p.m., whatever time it was when you came here. You're certainly not expecting to find this particular group getting together at 8 or 9 a.m. What's it mean? Well, the sky is divided in half. Over here is the north point on the horizon, and there's an imaginary line running through the sky from the north point on the horizon through the zenith and spot directly overhead to the south point on the horizon. And if you use your imaginations forcefully enough, you might see that line appearing in the sky. And when that line appears in the sky, you'll realize that the sky is cut in half. And this meridian divides the east from the west. And you can watch a single star as it crosses the meridian. And you can get what is called its meridian altitude. And you can measure the time of that passage. And that gives you star time or sidereal time. And that's the most accurate kind of time that man can possibly observe. Or by measuring the altitude of Rigel or Betelgeuse or any other star as it crosses the meridian, we can begin to measure position. And here are the fundamentals of navigation. If we were watching the sun come up, we realize that the sun rises in the east and climbs higher and higher. And until the moment that it comes, it becomes noon, when it's on the meridian, it's before the meridian, or ante-meridian, or a.m., and the very moment that the sun crosses the meridian, becomes post-meridian, or past the meridian, or p.m. So you see, in the common phrases of a.m. and p.m., we're referring to astronomical concepts. Actually, if we want to now, we can change the thinking in terms of the celestial sphere, and think of it as a globe. You know that if you have a globe at home or in the classroom, if you look at that globe, there's a rod sticking up the middle of it. 
from the South Pole through the North Pole, and the globe rotates on that axis. And halfway between the North Pole and the South Pole, there's an equator. And parallel to the equator, there are lines called parallels of latitude. And from pole to pole, there are meridians of longitude. But the astronomer has lines that he has drawn in the sky, too, in his imagination. But in the planetarium, we don't have to depend upon the imagination, because we can simply prod your imagina imagination a little bit and say, don't you imagine you see some lines up there? And these lines are important lines, too. Because here we have parallels of declination, which are the same thing as celestial latitude. And we have our circles, which are the same thing as meridians of longitude. And then if we put the meridian back, we find that the meridian stands still while the other coordinates move. And every time one of these hour circles crosses the meridian, you know that an hour is passed. And if you watch the sky rolling overhead, you'll realize that there are 24-hour circles here because there happen to be 24 hours a day, which might be a surprise to you. I don't know. But the important thing is that the astronomer calls hours terms in terms of place rather than time. And time and place are really the very same thing as far as the astronomer is concerned. And that's the reason we can so easily say that the planetarium is a time and a space machine. And then if we wanted to, we can add the inside out of Earth to the picture. Or we can subtract any of these that we may wish, making any combination of them. And as we subtract them, we realize that we have a completely new type of teaching device. And the work that will be done with this teaching device here in the museum will open the door to a greater acquaintance with the stars on the part of youngsters and grown-ups alike. And I can just assure you that as we look at the stars with the aid of a planetarium, week after week and month after month and year after year, you'll inevitably grow closer to the sky out of doors. It won't take long. People think that it's going to take a tremendous amount of time to make friends with the stars. I can assure you that this is not the case. If you take a look at the sky tonight, maybe not tonight because I don't think it's clear out of doors, I'm not sure, but I don't believe it is. But should it be clear tonight, or if not tomorrow night or the first clear night, pick out a few stars, one or two or three or half a dozen at the most. Don't try to see a lot of them see a few. The next night, friends, you won't have to hunt for them because they'll be there the moment you go out and look for them. And then add two or three more stars to your acquaintance. And then after that, some more and more. Spend a few minutes a night, two or three or four nights a week. And I can assure you that it won't be very long before all the stars and all the sky will be your friends. And when this is true, you'll become familiar with the ancient legends of the stars. You'll realize that whenever you may go to a museum, whenever you may listen to fine music, whenever you hear of anything which is a mirror of the cultural possessions of men, you'll be thinking of things which are close to the stars because from the stars came their birth. These are some of the reasons why you should look at the stars. Some people are very crass and materialistic. And they say, but what's the use of astronomy? <laughs> oh, I could tell you so many things about the uses of astronomy and navigation and timekeeping and surveying, but why bother about that? Let me simply ask you one compound question.